sorry sir sorry 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 for the delay sir so this is the first time i'm doing it in a, a large uh, large meeting i think so uh, and as i have said before i like it i to start to feel like a cat among the lions then okay so let me proceed to the topic proper the topic given to me is uh, dilated pupil so in a nutshell what are all the things i am going to give a brief introduction is pupillary pathways intermittent midriasis monocular midriasis binocular midriasis and few case reports i think all the above topics have been well covered by the previous speakers so i would like to go in a much faster manner so pupillary pathways it is mainly for the pgs can be of two segments one is for constriction of pupil and the other one is for dilation of pupil constriction of pupil is uh, occurs with light reflex as well as with the accommodation reflex so entering into the constriction of pupil which is meiosis uh, we have one efferent that is final common pathway and two afferent that is one is for light reflex and the other one is for near reflex so let me uh, give a brief uh, outline about the efferent pathway that is the final common pathway so it starts from the edinger espal nucleus which is the part of third cranial nerve it gives the parasympathetic output and highlighted points are as the third nerve travels in the subarachnoid space this point has already been uh, highlighted by the previous speaker the fibers of the pupil are located medio dorsally and they come in close to posterior communicating artery and as it travels the cavernous sinus they are more diffusely distributed around the periphery of the nerve and finally as it enters the superior orbital fissure it travels via the inferior division now as it reaches the ciliary ganglion the points to be remembered is preganglionic receptors are nicotinic receptors and postganglionic are muscarinic and from the ciliary ganglion short ciliary nerve arises and finally it supplies the pupillary sphincter and ciliary body so regarding the ciliary ganglion this point is very important which has been highlighted by the previous speaker about 96.5% of the axons are concerned with near reflex and only 3.5% of the axons are concerned with the light reflex and this may be the responsible for uh, light near dissociation in certain ciliary ganglion lesions now going into the afferent pathway in short light reflex just main points 60 million rods are there 3 million cones are there and 1.2 million retinal ganglion so see the ratio so how many rods and as it goes down cones and then retinal ganglion cells among the retinal ganglion cells there are two groups one group that depends on rods and cones the other group that is independent of rods and cones the rods and cones dependent population are concerned with the vision forming signals and those that are independent are not concerned with vision forming signals instead of that they are responsible for uh, circadian rhythm so here the fibers of rods and cones reaches the occipital cortex and here the fibers from the independent fiber uh, uh, goes to the superior suprachiasmatic nucleus sorry so as you all know the fibers of uh, light reflex travel via the optic tract and then it leaves before the lateral geniculate body reaches the dorsal midbrain and finally ipsilateral olivary pretectal nucleus and from there to the ipsilateral edinger espal and the contralateral edinger espal the fibers that innervates the contralateral ew nucleus travels via the posterior commission this is an important thing as uh dorsal midbrain syndrome there is an involvement of pupillary fibers so the next one what is the importance of knowing this division of two groups of fibers that is photosensitive dependent and independent rapid modulation in pupillary size actually that changes with the ambient light is um, with rods and cones and the slow and sustained pupillary response to light occurs with the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells now the afferent pathway for the near reflex as you all know near reflex is a triad of convergence accommodation and meiosis so for convergence the fiber start from the medial rectus it travels via the third nerve reaches the mesencephalic nucleus of the fifth nerve and pearlius nucleus and finally heading the spinal nucleus and for accommodation starts from the rods and cones optic nerve chiasma optic tract and before light reflex leaves before the lateral geniculate body but here the fiber reaches the occipital cortex and from there to the uh, occipital mesencephalic tract pearlius nuclei and finally heading the spinal nuclei so pupillary dilatation that is midriasis sympathetic pathway madam has dealt it very nicely so i am going to skip these slides now let me enter into the topic dilated pupils so how do how i am going to approach dilated pupil otherwise midriasis can be either a transient or intermittent one or it may be a permanent problem so those that are persistent midriasis can be further subdivided into either unilateral midriasis or bilateral midriasis so let us enter into the first one that is transient midriasis there are some of the causes of transient midriasis 
it may be an intermittent one a springing pupil a tadpole pupil hutchinson pupil and other causes intermittent metriasis it is nothing but an abrupt enlargement of pupil that lasts for nearly 5 to 60 minutes there will be no other associated findings the dilatation may be due to either sympathetic overactivity or may be due to a parasympathetic dysfunction it is more commonly seen in migraine or or even in aneurysmal compression so this is for the pgs how to differentiate whether the dilated pupil is due to sympathetic overactivity or parasympathetic dysfunction pupillary light reflex in sympathetic overactivity will be weak or just present in parasympathetic dysfunction it is absent the intrapalpebral fissure will be larger than the contralateral eye in a sympathetic overactivity situation and in parasympathetic dysfunction it will be smaller than the contralateral eye amplitude of accommodation will be normal or reduced in sympathetic overactivity and it will be markedly reduced in parasympathetic dysfunction springing pupil otherwise known as benign episodic metriasis or benign episodic anisocoria that occurs recurrently unilaterally either in the same eye or in the alternate eye most common among the female population with migraine the duration may be either hours or even days some of the group may develop generalized ganglion tadpole pupil tadpole pupil as you see in this picture there is a intermittent spasm of a segment of dilator muscle that is only a portion of the pupil goes for constriction and hence that portion goes for a narrow segment the pupil size here will be either oval as if as you look in this picture or it may be an irregular one circular with a narrow segment this is the narrow segment that extends into the direction of the affected dilators producing a shape of a tadpole this is often encountered in patient with a prior history of migraine hutchinson pupil that occurs with increased icity where when the hunkers go for herniation there will be a compression of third cranial nerve and since the fibers are more superficially located they are the first to get trapped and hence dilated pupil in a coma is an important find an oculo sympathetic spasm where pupillary dilatation is brought about by elevation and stretching of ipsilateral arm or leg it occurs with the lesion of c3 to c6 segments of ca the causes are trauma infarction or syringomyelitis and some other causes for intermittent metriasis number one seizure you may all know that during the seizing activity the pupil goes for dilatation but the point is it has no localizing value and some interesting point regarding cjd where the pupil goes for rhythmic oscillations it is found especially among the progressive cjd with predominant right hemispheric involvement and among the drugs scopolamine patches and aerosolized uh, ipratromium bromide can cause dilatation of pupil intermittent metriasis headache syndrome such as migraine tacs iris problem starting from ischemia of iris or even sphincter injury and finally angle closure clock and don't forget that there, whenever there is an intermittent increase in sympathetic tone such as fright or pain in patients with previously unnoticed unilateral horner syndrome it may go for a reversal of anisocoria where the dilated people may be mistaken for the abnormal one and going into the topic proper that is the second half persistent metriasis as i have said before it can be either in one eye or in both eyes that is monoocular or binocular now let us discuss about the monoocular metriasis so whenever a pupil is dilated in one eye we have to think where is the lesion what are all the possible locations so the lesion may be from number 1 at the level of nucleus of third nerve or in the ocular motor motor nerve proper or number 2 at the level of ciliary ganglion number 3 it can be at the nm junction or it can be in the muscle itself so the first one the lesion may be in the third nerve second one in the ciliary ganglion third one pharmacological dilatation and fourth one the iris pathology so now let, let us enter into the third nerve palsy whenever you come to see a case of third nerve palsy you have to go through all the four uh, points first one you have to look for whether it is complete or incomplete is the pupil involvement is there or not if it is painful or not and are there any signs of aberrant regeneration painful ophthalmoplegia is more common with aneurysmal compression and it's also in diabetic third nerve palsy so as previous speaker have highlighted all these things just uh, skip up through this uh, basic one oculomotor nucleus are of two groups unpaired group and a paired column unpaired group includes a rostral one that is heading the rostral nucleus and caudal one lps subnuclei and fourth four uh, paired column medial one and lateral one medial one innervates the superior rectus its axon goes to the contralateral superior rectus subnucleus and lateral one innervates all the other muscle the lps subnuclei innervates innervates both the 
LPS, that is bilateral. So when it leaves, it becomes the fascicle and it travels anterior and medial to the red nucleus and substantia nigra and exits at the level of intraparenchymal fossa. As it travels through a subarachnoid space, it travels between the superior cerebellar artery and posterior cerebral artery, runs parallel to posterior communicating artery and finally lies medial to the temporal lobe, especially on the free edge of tentorium cerebral. As it reaches the cavernous sinus, it lies in the lateral wall of cavernous sinus, enters the superior orbital fissure, and finally divides into superior and inferior one. The superior division innervates superior rectus and LPS, and inferior one, all the others, including the pupillary parasympathetic fibers. This division into superior and inferior may, may take place in any of the place. Don't think that it occurs only after exiting or at the posterior or anterior aspect of the cavernous sinus. This division can occur even at the level of cavernous sinus or posterior orbit or even at the fascicular level physiologically. So as we have refreshed all the basic one, now let us enter into certain lesions and how to diagnose. If the lesion is at the level of nucleus, as I have said before, LPS is bilateral innervated, there will be an associated bilateral ptosis with bilateral or contralateral superior rectus weakness. And if Edinger Westphal nucleus is involved, pupil will be dilated. Now, fascicular fibers, if it gets involved as the fiber travels to the uh, some other structures in the midbrain, there are certain associated findings will be there. For example, in Weber syndrome, there will be a contralateral hemiplegia. Here, the lesion is at the level of base of the midbrain. Benedict and Claude, the lesion is at the level of tegmentum of the midbrain, where because of the involvement of the red nucleus, associated tremor will be there or chorea will be there. And nothing else syndrome, there will be an ipsilateral ataxia due to involvement of ACP at the level of tegmentum. As it travels through the subarachnoid space, the lesion, anything that traps the nerve at the level of subarachnoid space will cause isolated third nerve palsy. As it enters the cavernous sinus, it has friends, so it will be accompanied by fourth and sixth nerve cranial palsy with first and second division of trigeminal nerve involvement associated sympathetic tract involvement also. As it travels through the orbital apex, if it gets trapped there, associated second nerve involvement will be there. In addition to that, the patient will have proptosis, chemosis, conjunctival injection. And SOF, there will not be a second nerve involvement, but all the other findings will be there. So this is an important differentiation between orbital apex and SOF. So whenever a second nerve is involved, always think of orbital apex being affected. Some interesting point regarding a clinical uh, scenario, that is clinical features. When the lesion is at the level of tectum, pupil will be of dilated associated uh, edinger westphal nucleus involvement. So the light reflex will not be there. If the lesion is in the dorsal midbrain, there will be a light near dissociation. At the level of subarachnoid space, pupil will be dilated. Light reflex will be absent. Accommodation will be absent. As it reaches the cavernous sinus, when there is a problem at the level of cavernous sinus, because of involvement of both the parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers of the pupillary, pupillary innervation, the pupil size will be of mid position rather than dilated. Here, the light reflex will be absent and accommodation reflex will be absent. And at the level of ciliary ganglion, which is called a stonic pupil, the pupil initially will be dilated on. As it becomes a chronic one, the pupil becomes a constricted one, that is meiotic pupil. So here, the light reflex will be slow. It constricts very slowly to light. And after removing the light source, it dilates very slowly. Accommodation reflex will also be very slow. So the second one lesion that is at the level of ciliary ganglion, which is otherwise known as tonic pupil. Site of damage is the ciliary ganglion or in the short ciliary nerves. So what initially happens? What are all the clinical findings? The first and foremost finding, the acute presentation will be an isolated internal ophthalmopathy where the pupil will be a fixed dilated one with even the loss of accommodation. As time passes on, the pupil now becomes large. It reacts slowly to light. It reacts slowly to near stimuli or accommodation. When you ask the patient to go for an after distant refixation, there will be a slow tonic redilation. That is otherwise known as transient reversal of anisocoria. This is because the normal people dilates much faster and the tonic people dilates much slower. Here, as the tonic people appears as if it is small and the normal people becomes as if it is large. Hence, it is called as a reversal of anisocoria. Pupil constrict better to the near visual stimuli than to the light stimuli. As I have said before, there is a 30 is to 1 ratio of parasympathetic fibers mediating the near reflex. That is 96.4% uh, of the fibers have been allotted to near reflex and only remaining portion has been allotted to the light. So here is a picture showing the tonic pupil. See the first one, the light is shown, but the pupil is dilated, not reacting properly. And now it's a near reflex. See the pupil starts to constrict. 
So what? How does it? How does the pupil appear? It's an irregularly shaped one where the sectoral portion may go for hypokinesia with vermiform writhing movements. Why this vermiform writhing movements occur? These are the words quoted from the Paul Brazis. The vermiform iris movements represent the physiologic pupillary unrest or hippus that becomes more impressive when it occurs only in portions of the iris in which the iris sphincter still reacts. In going on to the slit lamp examination, pupil will be of irregularly oval or out of round pupil, appears to be unresponsive to light, small sectors of pupillary sphincter control in a random fashion that is not related to light structure. The diagnostic test at dilute pilocarpine test where we are using 0.125% installed into both eye. Affected eye dilates, the normal eye do not dilate, hence there will be a, once again a reversal of anisocoria. This sensitivity, that is the dilatation of the pupil even to a diluted pilocarpine point one to is due to denervation hypersensitivity. So he, here, this is the abnormal pupil. In the bright light, the pupil is dilated. In the dim light, Normal pupil gets dilated as well as the abnormal pupils in the same size. And after installation of pilocarpine, see what happens here. There is a reversal of anisocoria. What are the causes of tonic pupil? Idiopathic mostly, post infectious, for example, herpes, syphilitic botulism, non infectious inflammation, gencil arthritis, systemic autoimmune disorders such as GBS, Miller Fisher variants, CADP, ischemia, orbital vasculitis, GCA, PAN. Malignant infiltration, paraneoplastic process, and finally, local causes such as trauma, surgery, or laser therapy. Some of the syndromes for the post graduation what is benign at these people? It's an acute painless enlargement of pupil, unilateral in 80% of the cases, associated with decreased corneal sensation found among the healthy young women, and it is due to viral ciliary ganglionitis. Some of the syndromes, home study syndrome, where Hyporeflexia will be there. It is due to dorsal root ganglion involvement and associated tonic pupil will be there. What are all the other associated findings? As I've said before, there will be an associated reduced corneal sensation. In Ross syndrome, both of them there. Hyporeflexia is there. Tonic pupil is there. But other finding is a facial anhydrosis or progressive segmental anhydrosis. And Harlequin syndrome, hyporeflexia is there. Tonic pupil is there. Other finding is impact facial flushing to thermal or emotional stress. Third cause that is at the level of NM junction that is pharmacological metriasis. The pharmacological metriasis can be due to either sympathomimetics or anticholinergics. So sympathomimetics means example phenylephrine, anticholinergics which we are using here, tropic amide eye drops, ipratropium nebulizers, inadvertent transmission of scopolamine from retroauricular patches. So this is a dilated pupil from pharmacological metriasis. Look at the pupil size. It is very large, often large. It is about more than 8 millimeter, often 10 to 20 millimeter, much greater than that what you see in third nerve palsy or tonic pupil. Associated some findings that will be useful for clinical localization. There will be associated plants to conjunctival vessels. Residual light re reaction will always be there, as the previous speaker said. And in some conditions, there will be a retracted upper eyelid due to the sympathetic stimulation of the upper eyelid retractors. So diagnosis, since it is a pharmacological mentary acid, the pupil will never transmit even if you install 1 to 2% of pilocarpine. Installation of 1 to 2% of pilocarpine should consider any, constrict any midriatic pupil other than those that have been pharmacologically dilated. So coming into the role of pilocarpine in unilateral mentary acid localization, 0 0.1%, 1%, these two strands we are using for localization. When a pupil constricts to 0 0.1%, it is only of tonic or deep pupil. All the others will not constrict to that. And 1%, if you install 1%, the only pupil that do not constrict is pharmacological pupil. And finally, never forget the local pathology, that is midriasis due to iris pathology, the fourth one. Here, there will be no tosis, no oculomotor motility abnormality. Pupils will be of irregular margins. There will be associated tears. Light reflex may show irregular contraction. And finally, there will be no response to 1% pilocal. So overall, approach to unilateral large pupil. Look for any evidence of third nerve palsy. Look for any light near dissociation, which may occur with these people. Look for any irregular pupillary margin. If compatible with tonic pupil, you should go for 1.1% pilocarpine test. If there is no evidence of third nerve palsy or tonic pupil, administer two drops of 2% pilocarpine 
If still no construction, then the metriasis is pharmacology. So um, last speaker have highlighted this both two. So this is the pathway. Just to summarize, anisocoria and room light. Look whether the pupil is reacting to light. Yes, the pupil is reacting. This pathway is not concerned for me. If the pupil is not reacting, look on which one is small one or larger one that is not reacting. If the smaller one is not reacting, observe whether there is a near reflex. Yes, there is a near reflex, but light reflex is not so. Then the differential diagnosis are gale Robertson pupil. If reacts to near vision, iris dysfunction. This portion, leave it. Now let me come to my topic proper. That is larger pupil is not reacting. That is mid-reactic pupil. So once the larger pupil is not reacting to light, now go for the near reflex. Is there near reflex? Yes, there is a near reflex. Then probably it should be an additional. No, the near reflex is absent. That is light reflex is absent, near reflex is absent. Go for pillow carpet institution. Yes, it is reacting to that. Then it may be either thermopalsia, iris. No, as I have said before, even after installation of one to two percent of pelocarpin, if pupil is not reacting, it is a pharmacological block. Now the other group that is dilatation of pupil in both eyes. When a pupil dilates in both eye, as I have said before, it may be either an increase in sympathetic tone or a decrease in parasympathetic tone. So increased sympathetic tone can be hydrogenic following installation of drugs, phenylephrine or tricyclic antidepressant or recreational drugs such as cocaine, where alpha one agonism causes dilatation of pupil. And decreased parasympathetic innervation can occur from any lesion from afferent as well as efferent pathway. For example, in the afferent pathway, when there is a severe bilateral blindness involving that is including macula, severe bilateral optic neuropathy, and effect in efferent pathway, the localization may be either at the heading respiratory nuclear or bilateral third nerve or ciliary ganglion, neuromuscular junction or iris muscle. So this is a simple chart showing what all the causes of the bilateral third nerve palsy. It can be a parasympathetic palsy or sympathetic stimulation. Sympathetic stimulation, a group of drugs such as phenylephrine, ephedrine, cocaine, and adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine. It can be a component of pheochromocytoma. Coming onto the parasympathetic palsy, Drugs, atropine, homotropine, TCA, antihistamine overdose, hypermagnesemia, glutathamide, and third nerve palsy can be uh, guillain barry syndrome, can involve both the sites, botulism, diphtheria, CNS disease such as encephalitis, syphilis, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and envenomation like snake, via web spider, puff and Australian blue ring octopus, which we are not going to see here. And finally, miscellaneous causes of bilateral third nerve palsy. It can be a cardiac arrest, cyanide poisoning, hypothermia, barbiturate overdose, methanol poisoning, deep anesthesia, propanolol overdose, and total spinal anesthesia. And few words regarding coma and dilated pupil. When there is a confusion whether the dilated pupil is due to midbrain injury or whether the patient has gone for midbrain brain death, this simple clinical uh, test has been given, which I have noticed in Plum and Postmas book. Just go for examining the ciliospinal reflex. If the ciliospinal reflex is intact, it is probably due to midbrain injury rather than a brain. In other words, ciliospinal reflex indicates that the brain stem is still functioning. And among the pandemics, which we are almost traveling for nearly one and a half years, COVID-19 and pupils, and this was dealt very easily in the previous topic, two, year, two weeks back, I think so. Neurological association of COVID is a wide spectrum. I am not going through detail. This is the diagnostic criteria. Many things are presenting CNS, PNS, starting from GBS, everything else. What are all the association, neuroophthalmic association of coronavirus? We do see cases of optic neuritis, cranial neuropathies, and MFS, MFS Miller syndrome. So, this is an article that has been published Tonic People After COVID 19 Infection. So, here you see what may be the possible causes proposed. It may be due to direct viral invasion or due to an endothelial dysfunction or a neurotoxic effect. And even it may be a component of a cytokine storm. In concurrent tonic and trochlear nerve palsy, another interesting article. Third nerve palsy due to COVID-19 infection and some case histories, if time permits. So shall I proceed? Hello. Yeah. Excuse uh, me. Ramu, you have two minutes. Okay, you sir, already okay. exceeded your time. You have two minutes, oh. please. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So some case histories I'm going just going to skip. First one, 36-year-old female patient, three weeks history of left eye photophobia and blurred vision. 
She noticed her. She noticed her left pupil dilated during this time. Past history, she was treated for COVID-19, as I have said before. So on examination, she had an enlarged pupil that is not reacted to light, near response impaired, absent DTR associated, and no other clinical finding. Investigations done, everything seems to be normal. And regarding dilute pilocarpine test pupil, the abnormal pupil constricted to that. So what is our diagnosis? It's a tonic pupil. The second case, 38 year old female patient presented to a hospital with acute severe asthma. So admitted to the ICU segment, ventilation intubation done, nebulization given, and after extubated, extubated after eight hours following recovery. And few minutes later though, nurse noticed that her right pupil was somewhat dilated compared to the left. So here, until unless you notice the history or notice the treatment, you go on investigating, everything seems to be normal. And finally, they have noticed that while receiving salbutamol and ipratopium so an in-circuit nebulizer system, it was, seems to be closer to the left side of her face and hence it was caused for the dilatation of pupil. Case 3, 78-year-old man presented with acute onset of diplopia. Right upper litosis was there, impaired levator function, dilated right pupil, anomalous eye movement when attempting elevation, depression, adduction, no other finding. This is the picture, seems to be normal. And this is an idiopathy cast of third nerve palsy. And finally, fourth one, 71 year old female patient came to ED with left osis and ocular motor nerve palsy, dilated pupil. Three days later, she noticed a strange sensation of something moving upward on her left neck. Next morning, she noticed complete left osis. Examination showed a left osis with left third nerve palsy with dilated pupil. Her left eye also deviated down and out and dilated size was about 7 millimeter and did react to light also. She had complete left third nerve palsy with pupillar involvement. Other tinea nerves were normal. An investigation, MRA with MRA seems to be normal. Then they have done for top MRA. Yeah, there was a prominent flow signal in the left cavernous and picosal sinus. And cerebral angio showed a left cavernous DAV, DAVF in a branch of meningohyphiocele trunk of uh, distal intraocular cartilage artery. So the diagnosis was DAVF in the left cavernous sinus. So this is the picture. So I would like to finish the talk uh, with this slide. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. This was uh, told by Lao Tzu. So for the PGs, uh, always start first, learn every day, learn few points every day. It will be useful to your future. Also.